Hi, I'm Len Epp from Lean Pub, and in this episode of the Front Matter Podcast, I'll be interviewing Jane Friedman. Based in Cincinnati, Jane is an expert on the book publishing industry and a popular speaker and consultant on business strategy for both publishers and authors, and co-founder and editor of The Hot Sheet, which is by some distance the best newsletter there is for authors interested in keeping up on book industry trends and controversies. You can follow her on Twitter at Jane Friedman and check out her website at janefriedman.com. In addition to the hot sheet, I also recommend you sign up for her really fun electric speed newsletter, which includes great tips on all kinds of apps and digital resources for writers and content creators in general. In this interview, we're going to talk about what happened in the book publishing industry in 2022 and maybe a little bit about what might happen in 2023. So uh, thank you very much, Jane, for being on the Front Matter podcast again. My pleasure. Thank you for having me back. Um, so the last time you were on was in uh, May 2020. Um, right at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and so, uh, um, you know, a lot of the things I think we're probably going to talk about are going to be kind of high level pandemic things. Um, and one of those things that was a potential issue early on in the year was um, supply chain management, something that, something that we all sort of became familiar with that we maybe weren't familiar with before. I think yes. started getting clogged, but in particular for the book publishing industry, uh, paper <laughs> was, it was yeah. a very serious issue. So I was wondering if you could recall kind of what the challenges were and how things worked out. Well, it wasn't just paper. It was basically everything that's required to make a book. Um, prior to the pandemic, the printing industry was already consolidating and books are a very small percentage of what paper is manufactured for and what printers print. So, you know, the book publishing industry is in this kind of unlucky position of being like lowest man on the totem pole as far as printers are concerned. And so what's happened is that over time, there's just less and less capacity from printing books. And then the pandemic came and really threw a wrench in things. Um, as of today, I think things are starting to recover, um, but there are still issues that you know, are, are painful that are leading to increased costs, uh, like printing in China um, has been problematic for quite some time now, I think for reasons that are obvious. And then freight costs were sky high during the pandemic, and they're just now starting to come down. But this has all had the, the effect of increasing prices on books. And, you know, people who buy ebooks might not really notice increased prices as much. I mean, they were already high to begin with. That's another thing we could discuss. Um, but print books, especially hardcovers, I think it's not unusual to see a few dollars more being charged now. A lot of publishers had to change their pricing, especially small presses. You know, they might have been able to sell a paperback for 15 to 20 uh, prior to the pandemic. Now it's 20 and up. Um, it's for me, it's actually been shocking to see some of these price increases, but um that's where we are. And I don't know that it's going to be resolved uh, except for the very biggest publishers. I know it might not be resolved for, for years. Um, and we, it may be the new normal. Yeah. And I imagine, especially with um, just general inflation, uh, the general yes. inflation that we're all experiencing, people might, in a sense, the, the publishing industry might get off the hook a little bit for raising prices because people are just like, well, the price of everything is going up. True. True. Um I, in the UK, that's where I've seen more noise coming from booksellers saying, you know, the prices aren't sustainable. Like we see people coming into the bookshop, seeing the 30 or 35 pound hardcover and then leaving. <laughs> but I think they're in a little bit of a different situation because they have more discounters, grocery stores, uh, places that are selling books for half off. And we don't have quite the same phenomenon here, except I mean, it's called Amazon, I guess, um, but it's it's not I don't I haven't seen booksellers yet in the United States complain, um, but certainly hardcover sales are down this year. Um, partly that's because sales were so great in 2021, so it, it, they can't help but come down. But I think there is there's starting to be some concern that the market is softening again, um, but we'll see. It's too early to say. Yeah, one of the um, impacts of the pandemic and people, particularly people being at home and locked up, uh, mm -hmm. was book sales went up for anyone listening who wasn't aware of that. Um, you know, there were there were various industries that profited 
greatly from from the pandemic. Um, I mean, I shouldn't say the book publishing industry profited greatly. They never, it never really does, right. or, or, or like, except for maybe the, maybe the very big players. But um, you know, laptop sales, home office equipment, you know, uh, baking uh, yes. supplies, yes. and things like that. But books, books were in that world, and so what a lot of people in the book publishing industry experienced was an increase in sales, something you get used to, <laughs> mm-hmm. and and mm-hmm. when they go down back to normal, you often experience it as a decline rather than a return to normal. Right, um, exactly. Something the industry is going through. Um, yeah, something that is often said is that books do well during tough times because it's a cheaper form of entertainment or people are looking for comfort. Um, and so I think that has, I think that basically was true maybe during the pandemic. Um, but it'll be, the, the other thing that publishing people like to say is that the value of a book is so tremendous because prices really haven't increased or kept pace with inflation. So if you look at book prices in the 70s or the 80s, they're not like dramatically different today, um, whereas other prices have shifted a lot. And so some are trying to justify, you know, what we're going through now is a correction given that book prices have remained flat. Uh, you mentioned you wanted to talk, or maybe wanted to talk a little bit about ebook pricing, uh, which is a sort of perennial <laughs> issue. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if you wanted to talk about that for a couple of minutes and what your views are about what's been happening or what's going on there. Oh, I mean, by now I would have thought that th- this is really talking about the big five here, the big New York publishers like Penguin Random House. In my view, have artificially inflated the price of ebooks. The reasons for that, I, I don't want to get into the weeds, but it basically puts print book pricing next to it, if you're shopping on Amazon, the print looks far more attractive because Amazon discounts it. Um, And if you look at people who are really strong in the digital space, digital publishing space, that would include like Amazon publishing and some other small publishers that really started digital first. You know, their pricing is more, uh, you know, around the five to eight dollar mark for an ebook. Whereas the traditional publishers, again, big five mostly are keeping that price you know, north of $10, $15 for new releases is common. And it makes it really hard, I think, on debut authors in particular. Um, people aren't necessarily going to take a chance and buy that $15 ebook. Um, and so there, it's, I don't, from a marketing perspective alone, it just makes me wonder why publishers haven't softened their stance. And that part of it's because they want to preserve the print market, but given how, more sales are shifting online and, you know, just the changing landscape of book selling, I would have thought there would be better pricing on ebook, especially with the supply chain issues. Right. But no, not yet. So this is one of those issues where I immediately go into plaintive voice, you know, why on earth, you know, um, uh, and, you know, and have been for a decade, decade going right down that path, because it is, it is just wild, like from a business perspective, for example, like if you, if you, if you were an alien and you didn't know anything about this industry and someone was like, well, you can either distribute your product with no manufacturing at all and make a, a, like 10 times the margin yes. on every sale why wouldn't you prioritize that product over the other? And I'm distinguishing eBooks, which are transmitted for created and copied and transmitted for free, as opposed to books, which have all these come Mm -hmm. from trees and, you know, have supply chain issues and stuff like that. So in plaintive voice, why is it (laughs) that the book publishers, uh, uh, why is it that print is so important to them? Well, I think partly they want to preserve profits. They profit a lot off the hardcover books. Um, they're also trying to preserve the ecosystem that they rely on for discoverability and marketing, which is bookstores. Although, you know, arguably, uh, given all of the changes that's ha- that have been happening at Barnes & Noble in particular, uh, meaning they don't, they don't accept pay for play, promotion anymore. You can't pay to have your book put on a big front window display any longer. You know, given some of the realities now, I I have to wonder what exactly they're preserving. Um, but certainly I, I don't want to, you know, look askance at the very rich and vibrant independent bookstore market. Still though, um, it's, it's still strange to me that they wouldn't be looking for more ways to diversify their business, to create more ways to get customers 
on an email list and do other things that will help them in the future. Cause I don't think it's often been said that print is becoming a luxury item. And I think, especially when you look at sustainability issues and supply chain issues, you'd think there would be a lot more enthusiasm and energy around eBooks, uh, at least the same as there is around audiobooks, And that, that's yet another issue uh, to discuss, but you know, it's, um, yeah, I think it's, it's book publishing perversely takes pride in the fact that they haven't been disrupted like some other industries by by digital products. But I don't think it's going to be like a long term win. I think it's, think it's gonna it's very limited. Yeah, um, I think we'll we'll get around to talking about the uh, reputation for business acumen that the <laughs> big book publishers have when we talk about the Penguin Random House attempted acquisition of Simon and Schuster and the amazing Department of Justice kind of mm. trial that took place. Which, for anyone listening, like there are co- actual controversies in the book world, and sometimes they're like national news, which they were in the United States this year, which is kind of amazing. But but on, on, on another note, I want to say, I'm sure Jane and I both love print books. We all, we of course, we yes. understand the value of them and, and love them and stuff like that. But when we're talking about things from a business perspective, specifically from the weird ebook pricing strategies, yes. it's, it's you talk a certain way sometimes when you're, Correct. Complaining, when you're complaining about it. But um, uh, yeah, so... Um, Another kind of pandemic related thing, big high level thing that happened was something that got called, I think, in a kind of with the kind of ugly term, the great resignation. Mm -hmm. Um, But this was a kind of catch all term for a real phenomenon, which was people in jobs that asking for better treatment. Um, And this this actually affected the book publishing industry as well. I don't know this. I haven't read as much about this as I should have over the year, but I do know from Twitter. (laughs) Oh, yeah. That, um, you know, kind of labor relations and stuff like that were a big issue and are a big issue in the publishing houses this year. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about just in general kind of what what happened and what's happening now. I think it's important to see this in the broader context of of cultural and societal change, uh, uh, like across the Anglophone publishing, or not just publishing, like across all Anglophone markets, generally speaking, or the Western world, generally speaking. Um, and I don't, I don't, um, it, it's not my, I don't have the pay grade to talk about this from, <laughs> uh, like did the pandemic spark this kind of new era or not, or were we already there and the pandemic sped it up? But it doesn't matter what industry you look at, there's more calls for fair treatment, better wages. There's definitely more unionizing that's going on and publishing is not immune to any of this. Now, publishing already had some aggravating factors um, that you could see it's very, you can easily see why workers are upset and they're asking for more. It's been a very low paid industry from the beginning. Um, Yet many of the best jobs sit in New York City or London where the cost of living is very high. And so that means you get employees who already have the financial wherewithal or support to make that work. Um, So we're talking about like white privileged elite sorts of people who take those jobs. And so this kind of goes hand in hand too with the diversity, equity and inclusion initiatives, um, which got more earnestly started, I would say in 2020. Uh, So right now, you know, probably the biggest headline maker is the Harper Collins unionizing as an example of workers asking for better entry level wages, better benefits, um, more diversity in hiring, more diversity efforts generally. And boy, like if I think about when I entered publishing, you know, in the 90s, I would. I don't think I could have ever anticipated or expected this sort of action. And it looks like they might very well be successful. Um, but it's not just Harper Collins. You know, we've, we saw, we're seeing unionizing efforts across bookstores, another area where you're expected to work for passion <laughs> rather than profits. Um, we're seeing it, um, gosh, in, uh, 
at smaller presses, at university presses, Amazon had its first um, union form, I think, in April uh, at the Staten Island warehouse. So, yeah, it affects every every piece of, I think, the supply chain, basically. I know that um, Ingram and some other places, you know, because of the labor shortage, they've had to raise wages. They've had to do other things to entice people to come on. And I can only imagine that's going to continue in some way. Um, yeah, I'll pause there and we, yeah. we can go off in any direction you prefer on that. Sure, sure. Actually, um, so one of the uh, things I wanted to talk about was, um, and, and uh, from, you know, preparing for this interview, we were talking before I started to hit the record button, but I'd sort of like lined up all the hot sheet newsletters from the year. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to ask you about was, um, why did Amazon shut down all of its physical bookstores? And I think mm-hmm. we may have just answered that question um when you know they're they're sort of starting to face unionizing which obviously the you know sort of management tier does not like and um you know having sort of exposure not only to for sort of physical retail outlets but specifically an in industry where people are unionizing might might be why they got out of that business it could be um i would i would have loved to seen you know the profit and loss on those physical locations um so yeah that was that was it almost it seems so long ago, but it just happened this year that they announced that they would be closing all those locations. Uh, and of course, now they're starting layoffs, which affects uh, their books division and their devices division, which includes Kindle. So that's like that's another like surprise for me to see kind of some weakness there. And like I can envision a future now where Amazon isn't predominant. There are some people who feel like they did lose some market share in the last year or two. Um, not least because people are becoming more conscious uh, of how they consume, where they consume, who they're benefiting when they shop. So I think Amazon, it's not seen as positively, that's for sure, as it was, you know, even like five years ago. Yeah, um, it's uh, the, I was the reason, one of the reasons it surprised me so much that they decided to close down their, their physical bookstores was that, you know, Amazon has incredible amounts of very local data. Uh, mm-hmm. on what people are buying. Um, yes. And I always thought that they were the part of the idea was to use that data to know like, oh, like there's a trend in Cincinnati for, you know, mm-hmm. you know, bread recipe books or something like that. Right. So all of a sudden they'd ship more to the store and promote them more. Uh, and so to see them back off of that. And and in that context, another thing I wanted to talk about was, um, so you had an article about how Indigo, I think, which is a Canadian, yes. is is in part a book chain. Uh, 40% of their sales are like home goods, which um, right. when you mentioned that there's this concept that books are becoming a luxury item, that kind of finally made something click for me about that phenomenon. Yeah, the indigo situation is fascinating. Um, and I I just, there, there's a particular newsletter I read by a Canadian publisher. It's called Shush by Kenneth White. He runs an independent house. And he is continually harping on how indigo is now a home goods store. And I probably shouldn't like laugh about it. Like he's upset and he feels like it's a travesty and you know i don't disagree with that but when you see the photos of the of these stores it's like you know we're not exaggerating here it is set up like a home goods store like like an ikea and then you like go off into a far corner and you find your book display of like the biggest bestsellers so um is that the future of books i mean i don't i maybe from a big box perspective but interestingly we have the opposite thing happening with barnes and noble where when their new leadership came in james daunt this was like at the beginning of the pandemic uh, or shortly before when he came on and he was like we got to get rid of this nonsense that's not about selling books and get back to uh, being in fact a bookseller and I think the jury is still out on on how that's working out for Barnes and Noble. But yeah, it's um, it's interesting to watch different countries handle whatever this new situation, new normal that we're in. It's um, actually you brought up Barnes and Noble. So Barnes and Noble is one of these kind of perennial kind of issues that comes up. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the one of the surviving national big box store kind of chains in the states um, that had a notorious kind of like 
annual shifting CEO situation or something yeah, yeah. like that and kind of weird, weird, weird kind of management changes that happening all the time. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, but they but they seem to have kind of sorted it out when they got the Waterstone CEO, uh, right. James Daunt, to come on board. And he it was interesting watching that. Like he started to keep who knows who, who was behind this sort of PR moves, but he tried to pull a little kind of Steve Jobs thing, like where he was going to change the inclination of the book display by like 0.1 millimeters or something <laughs> like that. I don't know if you remember that one, but um, that, that was for real. Like it was something along those lines. Um, so how, and, but then, but then there are obviously there's all kinds of labor issues and stuff like that with Barnes and Noble as well. And particularly um, one thing is, which is uncertainty, right? Which is often gets mm-hmm. left behind, like ha- having a job that you think you might lose any day, in terms of anxiety is it's different from yeah. being unemployed but you know it's not exactly like being properly employed either yeah barnes and noble over the last few years has shut a lot of people um and <clears throat> i mean i i would have to go research what percentage of their workforce is left from say five years ago but it gosh it just feels like a really tough situation there and they've closed a lot of locations um and when they reopen a new one it's almost always dramatically smaller so like they might have a fifty thousand square foot store that closes and then they'll say oh but we're opening a new one but then they don't mention oh it's about seven thousand square feet you know um so it's that creates other kinds of interesting and really unfortunate issues for authors. For instance, Barnes and Noble announced this year that they were pulling back on stocking hardcover front list, in particular in children's. And this um, this came as a surprise to many authors who you know had a hardcover book coming out and then got the news practically on launch date that it wouldn't be stocked in Barnes and Noble. So, you know, everyone's fearful that there's not going to be a place to, to market and promote new titles. Um, And that Barnes and Noble is moving into more of a, it's just the books you've heard of sort of situation. But again, I think it's hard to assess um, not least because Barnes and Noble has gone private since, you know, James Daunt took over and we don't necessarily know everything that's going on unless he decides to say what's going on. Uh, yeah, um, it's it's so interesting having these kinds of conversations because the book publishing industry sort of when you sort of think about it in in just sort of common sense way seems like, oh, bookstores, you know, Amazon and stuff like that. But it actually touches on so many things. So, you know, supply chain, labor, retail, um, uh, management fights, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. things like that. But uh, when you talk about, you know, for example, sort of losing losing venues to promote books, uh, then you get into sort of newspapers and media and social media. And just I think it was just today. And I believe I actually saw on Twitter that I, this might be your second conversation of the day because uh, you you had a conversation with Joanna Penn uh, where you talked about USA Today uh, firing their bestseller list editor and pausing their bestseller list uh so what's i mean i i know i'll point people to the other podcast in in the links but like is this a trend are bestseller lists going away now well i think what this is is uh really related to the newspaper and magazine industries i'll i'll refer to them collectively because i think they have similar challenges um so usa today is owned by Gannett, which is one of the last standing kind of newspaper conglomerates and they've just had a big round of layoffs um and that included their books editor who manages that bestseller list They've said officially that it's on hiatus, but the rumor mill that I'm tuned into has pretty much predicted it's it's over, um, which is a, a terrible blow, f- especially I think for self-published authors, people who um, prioritize eBooks, because the USA Today list is unique or was unique in that. It counted unit volume, and they didn't discriminate between formats like the New York Times does. It was put all the sales into one bucket, and whoever comes out on top comes out on top. And so you can imagine self-publishing authors really like that because they're really good at selling those eBooks, and they would you know, do box sets and anthologies and price them really low and get them to hit the list. It's really hard, if not impossible, to get a self-published book on the New York Times list at this point uh, or any other national list. So the USA Today, that was that was it. 
you know, and it has, you know, 150 spots. So you could be a USA Today bestseller um, much easier than some other type of list. But that's um, that development. It's it's sad. Um, it's and it's kind of aligns with some other developments of the last month where Book Forum, a big book review outlet, uh, has closed. It went under new ownership. The new owner quickly closed it because they were interested in other properties they were buying and not that one. And um, Astra closed. That's a literary journal that was only launched a couple years ago with uh, some very deep pocketed investors who even told them bluntly, you don't have to earn money. This is a prestige play. Well, even they got tired of the prestige play <laughs> with all of the money that they have. Um, and I feel like there's another maybe something else I'm missing that closed up. But yeah, there have just, it is so challenging right now for newspapers, magazines, um, and really everyone I think is in crunch, like like tightening the belts. Um, you can see it in Silicon Valley. You can see it across corporate America. Everyone is like, it's a recession. We need to pull back. We're, we need to be more um, efficient. Um, one other big dimension of the book publishing industry that we might be able to say something positive about um, is conferences. Yes. Um, so uh, shortly after you were last on the podcast, I interviewed Jürgen Boos, um, uh, who was the uh, CEO of the Frankfurt Book Fair. And he was on to talk about something else, but like it was kind of an exciting time because he was like, you know, the Frankfurt Book Fair for anyone listening is a BFD. Um, and, uh, you know, it's like a big for big, it's actually an important part of like the German economy. Um, and, uh, and, you know, when, when all the conferences were sort of in-person conferences were stopping, um, people really had to scramble to sort of figure out what to do next. And in particular, for example, the Frankfurt book fair, a lot of what happened there was like sort of, uh, agents sort of selling publishers selling books to booksellers and, you know, agents and kind of writers getting together with, with meetings. And I remember him talking about having like using tennis courts so you could sit on opposite sides of the tennis court instead of, instead of meeting rooms and stuff like that. And, but then they decided to go all digital, but anyway, um, our, our in-person book conferences back. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I do think Frankfurt book fair is unique um, and has staying power. I would, I would, I, I doubt that's going to go away, at least within my career lifespan. Book Expo's gone. I don't think it's coming back. Uh, Publishers Weekly has launched a new effort to support the U.S. market, but it's entirely virtual. It's not quite the same thing. Um, Digital Book World is coming back in January, and I'll be there. I'm really curious to see how many people turn out for that. It is going to be back in New York for the first time in quite quite a while. So will the publishers show up at that? I, I like everyone else, we'll see when I get there. Um, my conference schedule is picking back up, but I think there are... There's some things that, like BEA, I don't know that they're going to, they're going to return. Uh, you mentioned audiobooks. Um, this was something that I think Spotify started selling audiobooks this year, um, or, mm -hmm. or announced that they were going to. And so I was, yeah, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the uh, audiobook landscape in 2022. The format's still growing. Um, I thought it would have kind of at least gone into like single digit growth by this point after so many years of double digit growth, but no, it's still going strong. Um, I think th there are two big questions for me about the continued growth. One is will Audible and other retailers start allowing AI narrated audiobooks because the technology is now good enough that you can charge for it. I mean, you do have to be upfront in the marketing that this is AI narrated. You can't pass it off as a human being if it's not. Um, Will Aud Audible specifically doesn't allow it, but I don't know how much longer they can hang on to that position because both Google and Apple are allowing it. Be interesting to see if and when Spotify allows for that. So when, it's, it's to me, it's just a matter of when, not if. And then the other big question is, especially now that Marcus Doley is, has departed Penguin Random House as CEO, um, will Penguin Random House and maybe some other publishers be more interested in 
putting their audiobooks into the subscription services. So that, that would include like Storytel, uh, Scribd. And I'm sure that Spotify would love to have a subscription offering for audiobooks, but they weren't able to make it work. Like they couldn't come to terms with the publishers or, you know, I'm sure there were a million negotiating points. It's always been a problem for anyone offering a subscription service to get the biggest players in and to get the newest titles in um, because publishers have been demanding what are essentially a la carte prices, but that model doesn't work in an unlimited subscription system. Something we've been seeing is some subscription services, even from Audible, being launched in other markets like France or Scandinavia or Spain, they're starting to implement like tiered memberships where, okay, at this membership level, you get 10 hours and then it's 20 and 30 if you pay more. I think maybe it would be interesting to see more experimentation in that regard, because right now the Audible model, which is so prevalent in the US and the UK, which is one credit per, per audiobook, you want to spend your credit on something you feel is credit worthy. And there are lots of books that are never going to be credit worthy, children's books, for example, or you're probably not going to experiment with something if you feel, if you, if you're not quite sure you're going to like it. So I think the concern, of course, is cannibalization. Um, there's concern about lower payments to both authors and publishers. In Scandinavia, though, the the thing that gets repeated because that's where there's most uh, the most audiobook sales and the biggest market um, for unlimited subscription. If you look at them, they've seen tremendous growth and authors begging to have their backlist put in these subscription systems because once someone finds an author they love they immediately then go through the entire backlist so yeah i right now it feels like we're in um kind of very elementary stages of offering audio and given how popular it is how much it's growing it feels like there could be a lot more growth if publishers were more flexible and um why would audible not permit uh, a, using the term loosely AI uh, generated audiobooks. Quality control issues, perhaps. That's the only thing I can imagine. Um, but you know, if that policy, I don't know when that policy was established, but as of today, it's starting to look not progressive. Yeah, it's it's such an interesting uh, issue because one thing, I mean, you know, people's um, standards change when they encounter new types of technology or ways of delivering things. And sometimes their priorities change too. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, I mean, you know, with the explosion of podcasts and particularly like in-ear earbuds and stuff like that, like you see people walk around all the time now with headphones in listening to things and they're mostly actually not listening to music anymore. They're listening to words being spoken. And now these, most of these apps will have a like slow it down by half or double the speed. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of people like that. I hate it, but a lot of people love that double the speed feature. Um, and I think for a lot of people, you know, the idea that it's going to be, you know, Benedict Cumberbatch's voice, you know, is sort of less important than like getting getting the words, you know. Yeah. Um, and and it's a very especially for nonfiction. I mean, a lot of people are doing this for self help reasons to advance their career to learn something about business. And in that case, like, oh, there's a, I can click a button and get an audio version. You know, I don't care if if it's sort of like sultry tones <laughs> right right i i couldn't agree more and i think there's a huge swath of of books and publishers for which hiring a human narrator is not going to be economically feasible like scholarly works in particular but that if there were an audio edition it would definitely get sold um so ai helps resolve that yeah, definitely. And um, and even for self-published authors, you know, getting hiring a professional voice actor to do your book is very expensive. Um, yeah. Might be worth it, by the way. I'm not we're not I'm not saying it's not <laughs> worth it. But like, you know, one thing to keep in mind is to sort of not be all that that precious about things all the time. And particularly if you're, you have to be I mean, one thing that might become clear from conversations like this is that you have to be very creative and you have to try a lot of different things to make money in the book world. Yes. Um and, uh, you know, sort of just getting something out there might be way better for you and for your audience than sort of holding back uh, because, you know, you're you're too worried about quality, which is mm -hmm. not to say you shouldn't worry about quality. That's the number one important long term 
key to success as an author or publisher. But uh, still, you know, when it comes to audiobook quality in particular, uh, that might not be something that one needs to be so kind of concerned about. Yeah. Even even Medium, uh, the web, the sort of blogging website, has a, f- a free feature now where you just click a button and it reads reads the oh, post nice. for you, and it and it's good. Uh, which is actually something we'll, we, I mean, maybe we should, since we're talking about technology now, um, one of the big surprising things that just happened in the last month or so is the release to the public of uh, chat GPT, mm-hmm. um, uh, which is this uh, AI um, uh, thing that can, um, uh, well, why don't you explain a little bit about what it is? Because I know <laughs> you've written about it and it's, it's, it's fascinating. It is. Um, so there's a company called OpenAI that generates these models, uh, not just for text, but for art and other things as well. And, you know, I don't know what it sucked up from the Internet. I like how expansively it sucked things up, um, but it did such a good job. Uh, the current model is called Chat GPT 3.5. And you can basically treat it like a chat partner or like a Google search partner engine. You can ask it for a cocktail recipe, or you can ask it to explain what's the future of publishing. I tried that one to see what it would say. <laughs> and it will spit out something that's that looks pretty reasonable on the face of it. Now, it's going to be very generic, bland, voiceless. It's going to be just kind of just information without any personality, without real depth to it. But the fact that it can do that in you know a millisecond and give you something that's like publication quality, depending on your standards, um, I mean, it's pretty amazing. And we know that like we're still in the very emergent stages of this technology. It's not as good as it's going to be by a long shot. So, you know, People like Joanna Penn have been talking about this sort of tool for years now, kind of, you know, cheerleading and warning, like this is coming, you're not going to stop it. And I do see it currently as a great sort of assistant brainstorming partner, especially if you're able to train it on your own writing. And there is a tool out there that uh, I think it's still in beta that right now that would allow you to do that. Um, I think it's going to put pressure on, Uh, maybe the people whose writing just doesn't doesn't have voice or personality or that's just very rote. I read a really good analysis by someone who said this could hurt writers who are trying to make a living writing copy for like marketing or business purposes, because now um, a big company, a corporation of, of some kind could use something like chat GPT to fashion copy for something very quickly rather than hiring a freelance writer. So, um, yeah, I don't, i right now I feel pretty neutral about it. I know there's some people with some very hot, hot takes, uh, angry takes. Um, but it, I still think it's, it's so early. I, I think it's hard to predict exactly how it will play out. Yeah, thanks for thanks for sharing that and for that that great description. Um, one thing I would say is that actually um, some of the fun things it actually can have a bit of a personality sometimes. If you if you haven't played with ChatGPT, by the way, I really recommend giving it a try. It's quite a lot of setting aside concerns. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. So, for example, one thing, and this it's, it's funny you say like sort you know suddenly call it when you talk about writing by rote suddenly the freshman college essay became like a controversial kind of hot take kind of topic right because the first thing i did was go in and go like write it write it write an essay write a short essay about uh hamlet and it wrote one and like i you know i'm former phd i have a doctorate in english literature right so i've you know done done marking and stuff like that and seen a lot of first year essays and it was a b minus essay that was produced in a pretty good b minus essay which, you know, by the way, is kind of not the level that most students attain in their first year. Yes. Um, so it's better than most first year essays and it's produced in five seconds. Um, but I just bring this up to say, because the next one I asked was like, write an essay about Heidegger's being in time. And so I was posting these on Facebook and this friend of mine who's an English professor goes, now ask it to do a Celine Dion song about being in time. Uh, and it did. And it, 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 it was a coherent song with the with the chorus. And it, it kind of made sense, um, which was which was hilarious. And I think I think someone there's something going around like, you know, Twitter about um, uh, asking for like an instruction manual for why you shouldn't put a sandwich in your VCR in the style of the King James Bible. 
Yes. Um, <laughs> I read that one. I, I really enjoyed that. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, and that like, you know, the personality kind of comes from the question that you ask to some extent, yeah. but, but the really bracing thing with this kind of thing is that a, this is just what like us plebes are seeing now. Uh, who knows what's behind exactly. what, what, what the wizard has behind the curtain. Um, and when you think about where this is going to be in like, 20 years, which is like not an unreasonable horizon in the book publishing industry to think about. Um, you know, it's, it's quite, it's, it's really fascinating. Um, yeah, I think there are going to be some legal issues to sort through massive legal issues regarding ownership of the IP, given that these models are trained on stuff that's under copyright. And then if it's producing something that's in the manner of a Celine Dion song, um, is that problematic? Like, can Celine Dion say, no, you cannot do that? I, I don't know. Yeah, I think that reminds, actually, that reminds me of something uh, specific I wanted to ask you about. Um, but uh, yeah, copyright issues with AI generated, like with uh, any kind of automatically generated content. I think that there was a, a, a ruling in the States this year about that, saying that some type of content couldn't be copyright, copyrighted if it was artificially generated. Yes. Yes. I saw that same ruling. I don't know how narrow it was, like what it, what it might've been applying to. Um, but there's going to be a lot more like that. Uh, cause it's, there's just, I don't know. I, I don't even think we can fathom some of the sticky wickets that we're going to have to sort through. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, so that what what that reminded me of though the talking about copyright was that something called the Copyright Claims Board became active uh, in the United States in 2022, um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what what that is and ha has it had any impact on on anything? So this is essentially a small claims court where people who have their copyright infringed or they believe their their rights have been infringed they can file a claim um it's very inexpensive i think total it's maybe a hundred bucks to file a claim you don't need a lawyer the system is designed to be used by average everyday people who don't want to have to go through federal court to file a copyright case and federal court if you try to do that you know we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars to see that case to fruition and usually damages you know, aren't worth it. Um, so you have to have a really significant claim to even think about it. So this was something that was fought for by any number of organizations that representing artists, musicians, photographers, and writers. And I was pretty skeptical of it when it was, you know, making its way through um, uh, Congress, but it got approved. And it went into effect in, I think it was in June, and they started accepting their first cases. And they've been, you know, by and large, people are using the system as it was intended to be used. There was a lot of fear that copyright trolls would start submitting spur spurious claims and threatening average people, um, you know, just bad actors taking advantage of the system. But so far that hasn't happened. Um, and it seems like the court has been very efficient. Um, there hasn't been, in fact, a lot of writing claims. A lot of them have been related to photography more so than writing. So it's interesting to see how the court's being used. It's still been, it's still early, but I would consider it a really great option for people who feel like something has happened that's not right. You know, file the claim, and they will help you step by step um, make your case. Now, the drawback to this court is that whoever you're filing against can decide to opt out of proceedings, and then you're kind of back at square one, <laughs> like you would have to go to federal court. So for those who understand that, like uh, the people who are accused who understand that, um, that's unfortunate. But, you know, the court is hoping that people will play fair and, you know, do this instead of the threat of larger litigation ahead. Yeah, thanks very much for sharing your opinion on that and the facts of the case there. Um, I, I was skeptical of it myself from a couple of directions as well. I mean, partly the the fact that the the person, the accused, can simply opt out would seem yeah. to make it toothless. But um, my position changed when I kind of realized it's just an, it's it, its primary purpose is probably at least maybe not an intention, but functionally to deter bad actors from doing bad things in the first place, right? Because yeah. a bad actor if they know that someone can easily 
make things complicated for them and put them on a list, yes. um, you know, they might think twice about what they're doing. And in the past, it was very difficult for authors yes. to and expensive for authors to do this. And now if they can just, if they can make trouble for you quickly on the cheap with guidance, <laughs> right. you, know, you might, you might uh, think twice. Um, so that's good. Um, the, the other part of me that's skeptical about it though, is that although I know like from dealing with, with, with authors and, you know, having produced things myself, how awful it feels to encounter your book being kind of plagiarized uh, to find your work being sold under someone else's name um, or even under your own name. Uh, but, but, you know, someone's just got a hold of it and they're selling it for money. Um, uh, I know how awful it feels, but the advice we always give to authors is like, of course, send down a DMCA takedown or something like that if you want to, but you really shouldn't be spending your time fighting copyright violations. You should be spending your time writing and building your audience. Um, again, to sort of go go full plaintive voice, there was this article in the New York Times a couple of years ago where someone wrote about like how he had a he had a, a folder in his like email that he kept called thieves. And like, I just, you know, and I, I just got this image of this guy, this angry man sitting by himself in the dark at night, unable to sleep, trolling the internet, looking for instances of his book having been pirated. And it's like, mate, you're not, yeah. you're not, you're not improving your situation and you're not being a tough guy fighting back. You're just, you know, letting them in addition to steal your work. Now they're wasting your time and your emotions too. Right. Exactly. I couldn't agree more. It's, it's a fruitless effort. Yeah. But having, but having some system out there that, that does act as a sort of automatic deterrent is, is a good development, I guess, just as long as authors don't now spend all their, I know it's kind of an obscure worry, but as long as authors don't spend all their time going to the copyright board, making claims, uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully it will do the work that it's, uh, supposed to do. Um, so, uh, one, uh, very big issue. Actually, you know what? I'm going to talk about book. I'm going to ask you about book banning uh, in, in a little bit. But before we get there, hanging over this whole conversation basically has been the the sort of you know the it was the, you know like I said it was prime prime time news the book industry this year because yeah. Penguin Random House, which is one of the big, uh, I forget if it's always four or five, one of the big four publishing companies in the states, uh, tried to buy Simon and Schuster, which is another one of the, the big ones, and. Um, it's a very interesting thing, both in itself, but also because there's this high level shift happening under the Biden administration around monopolies and how monopolies mm. are treated. And there's a new kind of person in charge of this policy. Yes. And they alighted on this particular acquisition to kind of make a show of what they're up to. Yes. Um, and so I was wondering if you could just tell a little bit of the story of this, what this acquisition was all about and what happened in the end. So Penguin Random House, which is the biggest publisher in the United States, wanted to buy another of the big five, Simon & Schuster, which would have made it like two and a half times the size of any other competitor. So the Department of Justice um, blocked, uh, moved to block the merger. And, when, and what was so fascinating about it, it from the very beginning, was that they were basing their case not on harm to consumers, but harm to authors. And that authors would get paid less in the end should the merger occur. And it's a very novel argument to make in this sort of antitrust situation. And I, I think everyone you know, everyone who watches the government in these things seems to think this is laying the groundwork for other similar actions to pursue antitrust cases that aren't about consumers, but about workers, about workers being harmed. Now, for me, <laughs> sitting on the inside of publishing, I mean, I liked how all this unfolded in the way that it gave some transparency to what's a very opaque business, that people were asked very simple questions about the economics of books, about why books succeed or not. And uh, there was just a lot of throwing up of hands and like, it's random. Like that's what the CEO of Penguin Random House said. It's all random. Um, the CEO of Simon & Schuster said, 
taking credit for a book's success is like taking credit for the weather. And so obviously authors and all sorts of people are listening to these answers thinking, this is who I've entrusted my book with. <laughs> people who just think it's going to be random what succeeds. Um, but that's, you know, inside the industry, that's always been the conventional wisdom that you were going to have a lot of things fail. You would be surprised at what broke out. And, um, and you would survive on the things that did well while, you know, 80% of books didn't earn out their advance. So on the, I'm grateful that this information is circulating more avidly now. Um, but what really annoys me about this case really annoys me. And you already know what it is since you've been reading my newsletter is that this case focused on the top 2% of authors which is a very elite set of people who probably are already well off and are earning lots and lots of money and ensuring that they maintain their high advance levels of beyond $250,000. That's the set of books the case revolved around. These 2%, not all authors, not all advances, only that harm would come to the top 2%. We're talking about like a thousand authors. The other thing that kind of also I would be upset if I were an author is that when the economists for the government studied the effects of the Penguin Random House merger, which happened in 2012, 2013, they found that advances pretty much stayed the same or maybe increased for your average author. It was only when you got up into the high advance range of 250,000 or more that we saw advances decrease after that merger. And I, I just think it's stunning. I think it's stunning that the merger was blocked on those grounds. Now, I'm not here to say whether it was right or wrong, but I just think that is incredible. Yeah, thanks very much for that great description uh, and for your uh, pointed opinion about it. Um, I, I I share uh, some of the frustration. I think, um, yeah, in particular, there. I mean, there was something totally fitting about it, though, because the whole the whole kind of point of these big publishers is to present themselves as the guardians of the mm. eminences of our society, <laughs> right? Yes. Uh, which is the reason that the admission that they're they basically have a random business resonated so much with people who are kind of like with authors, basically. Yeah. Uh, it's like, wait, you make us write these 50 page business plans ourselves <laughs> for you and what they just go in the bin, you know, like, or, or they're pointless. Um, mm -hmm. Is that what you're really telling us? Or if you're the guardians of eminence, but you, you know, you're just throwing spaghetti at the wall is turns out is what's really going on behind those, those closed doors in those office towers in, you know, midtown, yeah. you know, um, uh, and then that's why, that's why it's sort of, but also in particular to focus on, as you say, you know, the very specifically like quarter of a million dollar advanced advances might go down and we've got one data point. Right. Uh, point to where that happened and it's like what's this all of this is supposed to be about protecting workers from exploitation from monopolies if that's what this is all about what on earth is all this theater for i know um there was one takeaway from the judge's final decision that i feel like yes this is why i could believe in this case if it were decided on these grounds um, which is where Judge Florence Pan said that, you know, if you're trying to sell a book today to one of the big five, you know, you're going to find that they're all paying the same ebook royalties, which are too low. They're all going to insist on having audiobook rights. Um, they're all going to pay you in four to five installments. Uh, like there are certain things that can no longer be negotiated at that level. And I think that is very unjust and unfair. And uh, w whether it's collusion, I have no idea. But it is it is this fact that authors have so little room to maneuver in these deals. And the agents inadvertently, I think, support that um, by they're just trying to get the biggest advance possible, raise the advance, biggest advance, because everyone knows most of them don't earn out. And no one seems to put pressure or care about the other deal points, like the royalties and the other things that, but, you know, I, 
I'm not blaming agents. I think they're playing the hand they were dealt, but it's just, um, that's where I felt like I think the judge nailed it. Um, but that's not what the case was decided on. <laughs> um, another thing you wrote about this year was, uh, I'm just reading a headline I hear about major media coverage doesn't sell books like it used to, mm-hmm. um, uh, which is a super interesting thing that has a lot of causes and a lot of effects. Um, uh, but it's in that context that major media doesn't cover. Well, let's, let's, why don't we begin with, uh, can you tell us a little bit about why major media coverage doesn't sell books like it used to? Uh, the media landscape is fragmented, splintered tremendously. Um, and also we talked about how newspapers and magazines are having tough times. The book section is like the first thing to go. Critics and reviews are paid so little to begin with. Um, so you've got that issue. And that particular piece you mentioned what really res- like the reason I wrote it was because we had someone from the New York Times who writes books coverage saying essentially the new york times doesn't sell books like it used to i was like wow you're willing to say that but it's true you know you can get i think authors are shocked authors who don't understand the business when they get that really big review whether it's the new york times or somewhere else and they look at their sales and they can't tell that the needle has moved if at all um and it's like what well what does move the needle? And for the last couple of years, it's been TikTok. So, you know, and it's not that I think TikTok is necessarily so special. It's just that we're finding that peer-to-peer recommendation, word of mouth, um, book communities have a lot more power now uh, to speak to the particular interests of, you know, their groups, um, influencers, now can recommend books and sell them in ways um, that are just as powerful as the New York Times. So I think that that's a high level of what we're seeing. Yeah, it's um, really fascinating. I've long sort of, I mean, partly just because of part parts part of the way Lean Pub works, I've long been a sort of proponent of the idea that establishing a personal connection of some kind between the content creator, like to broaden it from book authors and the, you know, kind of a gross term to use, but the content consumer, um, you know, let's just say authors and readers, right? Establishing mm-hmm. a connection between authors and readers is one of the most powerful ways uh, to build an audience and to and to sell and to sell books, basically. Yes. Um, uh, and it's because and the, the, the you know the fra- one feature of the one reason the fragmentation has happened is there's this proliferation of these platforms like TikTok, where people are all themselves become content creators, but they can talk about right. other people's creations. And so there's this as toxic as a lot of these things can be when they're positive, it's all very mutually reinforcing, right? So, you know, if there's an author that's outselling the Bible and then they like your tweet or whatever it is, that just feels great. You know, they saw it, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, they saw you for a moment and that like, you, and if you, and particularly, and this is the thing, it's important not to be cynical about all of this, like you really mean it and they really mean it. You really mean I loved your book. I love your work. And they really mean, thank you. Yes. Yes. Um, and that's for people who wonder why, you know, sort of book talk or TikTok or, you know, book talk as people might be familiar with is so popular. It's that like you make a fun, happy, cheerful thing uh, saying why you love the book. I mean, you know, what's what's not to like about that? Um, uh, the rest of TikTok you might leave aside, <laughs> uh, but um, but the book talk thing can, can be really great, um, which, of course, but in the context of, uh, you know, the mid list books are getting put at the front of the bookstores now. Um, uh, media major media coverage doesn't get you attention anymore. It's all social media. Uh, we inevitably have to talk about what's going on at Twitter. Mm, um, yeah. And you've you've written about this because you've got I think two hundred fifty thousand followers on Twitter. Twitter has been sort of a very great a great platform for you. Um, yes. So just what are your thoughts? <laughs> Sadness. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I I openly say I made my career on Twitter. And so to have that compromised, diminished, used as a tool for unsavory things, it's, it's depressing. I haven't given up on it. Um, I have created accounts at some competitors, you know, because... You know, Always good to claim your profile or your username before someone else does. Um, But I'm not particularly active on the alternatives because 
I don't know if you've tried and it like Mastodon, but if you go to some of these alternatives, everyone's still talking about Twitter. <laughs> it's, it's kind of like, it still sucks all of the air out of the room. It doesn't really matter that you've left. That's still the topic of conversation. So I'm going to stick with it until probably they turn off the lights, I suppose. Um, you know, as we're speaking right now, Elon Musk just ran a poll asking if he should remain in charge. And he said, I will abide by the results of this poll. And the poll said 57.5%. Yes, you should give it up and hand it over to someone else. And I, I hope that he does abide by his own poll. Um, so yeah, without getting into the politics of it, that's, that's how I feel. Yeah, um, uh, for anyone who's maybe listening to this sometime in the future, um, uh, what had uh, that sort of crazy, crazy thing happened this year where um, Twitter, one of the world's most popular social media platforms, um, became a target, and I'm just going to sort of name the name the politics a little bit, yeah, you know, sure. became the target of um, a very peculiar form of right-wing fascination um, regarding perceived bias, Yes. Um, and in particular, and this, I mean, perceived exclusion, which has become a feature of today's right, a sense and that you often see terms about the, the, the term, the public square being mm -hmm. used as, as forms of expression of a sense of being just generally excluded. And, um, uh, you know, the, the, there's various things that are fixated upon uh, the universities, for example, the academy mm -hmm. is one of these areas of exclusion um another area of ex perceived exclusion is the news media mm -hmm. um the or and and another um or the mainstream media which is the kind of term of art um and another one was twitter very specifically twitter um and elon musk uh you know the sort of at, at times the world's richest man um uh he 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 apparently is a true believer and and, and you know kind of signed on to this this movement um and so he uh bought twitter foregoing due diligence um uh for for a total price of 44 billion dollars obviously there's investors and debt and some weird thing about tesla shares in there and stuff like that but the ticket price ticket price was 44 billion dollars for a social media platform basically so he could control it um and the sort of the the message to his constituency was if you're in this kind of particular form of right-wing politics you're not going to be excluded from the platform anymore um and then he went in there and he started doing things like just kind of capriciously banning journalists yeah. um he he dropped in on like because twitter has i forget the spaces it has this yes. audio feature where you can uh, you know people can sort of attend and some people can speak and others can't and he joined in on one and then and then blocked it uh, yeah. because he didn't like what was, I mean, to put it crudely, because he didn't like what was being said about, about him and Twitter. Um, I mean, isn't, isn't that astonishing that the world's richest man has the time to drop in on a conversation and like, why did, like, I just find that mind blowing. Well, I think, I think it's explained by the, 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 the depth of this sense of, of resent, of resentment. Yeah. Um, of, of exclusion uh, that it doesn't, I mean, in, 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 you know, it, like it, I've, I've seen it expressed by very powerful figures like uh, Lachlan Murdoch, for example. Um, they, they get this, they actually get this look on their face of kind of bitterness mm. um, at some, so, again, some sense of being excluded. And, um, uh, you know, just to sort of just to briefly talk about that, like my view of it is like um, Umberto Eco had this, politically incorrect joke to explain a certain kind of mistake that people make about themselves, which was um, the man with a stammer who complains that he can't get a job at a, as a radio announcer because he doesn't carry the right party card. Um, uh, my apologies for the ableist joke, but it, but it does, it does capture the mistake that a lot of people are making about why they're being excluded from certain areas is not actually primarily your political views it's because you're not playing the game the way it's supposed to be played right and so if you pull move just asking questions type moves like mm -hmm. well if evolution's true then why are there still monkeys like you might want to consider that there's something other than your politics that's excluding you from various 
discussions. Um, and I would say, in, again, having a PhD myself, in particular, if you go to campus and you find that you're not getting good grades and, and people aren't listening to you, it might not be because of your politics. <laughs> Um, there might be something else going on. Um, and anyway, I, I just feel like writ large, you know, and particularly if you pull, if you pull just BS moves, like changing the subject or just charging people with inauthenticity, like if you get into a serious discussion, someone's made a substantive argument on a particular issue and you reply, you're just virtue signaling. What you're saying is, I'm not going to engage in a good faith conversation with you. So all these people who want to have it, they want to, they want to get in an argument with you, but you're saying I'm not going to do it. Right. And so there, that's the reason that you're often being excluded from these things. And I, I just go on about this because it is such an important phenomenon, including like the fact that very wealthy people are motivated to sort of turn all of their attention to these, to these, these kinds of this sense of exclusion and resentment. Uh, but yes, uh, so having gone on my my tangent there, um, I have tried, I actually signed on for Mastodon in 2018. Oh, um, okay. uh, so I, I had an account there. I think I followed you yesterday, but you know, it's, uh, it's, um, and I tried Hive. Um, uh, I've applied for Postia Hive. I, I shake my head as well. Unfortunately, I mean, don't know, no disrespect or whatever, but, um, but yeah, I feel that, you know, I, I, I feel sad about it as well. I mean, for particularly for me, I'm probably like a lot of people, you know, the old joke that Facebook is who you went to high school with and Twitter is who you wish you did. Um, <laughs> uh, and so I thought basically use, uh, that's like how I get a lot of news. Um, cause I follow yeah. a lot of journalists on there and it would be, it would be a real loss if it went away. Yeah. I mean, it's been the writing and publishing water cooler since I got on and it's hard to see how that gets replaced in the same way. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I, I feel like there's some sort of very slow motion grieving process going on, um, collectively and, um, but I, I still retain a, a modicum of hope that it might get out of its tailspin. So, um, to go on to another easy to discuss topic, um, uh, uh, book banning is a thing uh, in the States now, particularly with school libraries. Um, but but it does extend into the library space more generally, where there's like children's sections of book book libraries and stuff like that. I just saw a headline today about some move in Texas to put like age warnings on yeah. books and stuff like yeah. that. So maybe let's imagine we're talking we're talking to a, an audience outside North America, and they're like, "Can you, Jane? Can you please explain to me in five minutes what this is all about?" Ooh, um... So there's a, a movement in the United States uh, concerned with parental rights. And I think that's at the root of a lot of what we're seeing in terms of the book banning. Now, I'll back up for a second. Book banning is not like new. It's been going on for many, many decades. I'm sure since books maybe were first printed, there's probably been a book ban of some kind. But usually, as far as like schools and libraries, these things would be brought up by parents, you know, concerned citizens, and it would be one off sorts of requests or bans and certainly not highly politicized or what like what we're seeing now. The twist here and what makes it feel more dangerous and awful is that it's not parents necessarily that like a, a one off parent. It's co a coordinated effort by political groups, a coordinated effort to get people on school boards, coordinated efforts by legislatures to ban books. And that's something that at least I haven't seen before. So there was a, I think over the summer, it, I'm not saying it, the problem is not as bad today, but over the summer, I feel like there was like a fever pitch that we reached um, where it, just left and right, we saw like a few states doing like wide scale bans. I think Florida and Texas were two of the biggest, important to note which states here, the red states are the ones that tend to have um, particular sorts of governance <laughs> um, that leans to the right. And so what we saw is that they were taking entire like ebook subscription services or libraries down unavailable for access because of certain titles that maybe slipped through the gates 
um, I don't want to get too much into the weeds of this, but with a subscription service that a library might use, I mean, there could be tens and tens of thousands of titles in there that are, you know, technically available to the public, but they haven't been, each one hasn't been vetted and placed in the library by a librarian. So over the summer, we saw some action that was triggered by some of these digital subscription services and some of the collections that they had that were offensive to people. Um, I think some of that has been resolved, but it's it, it can be hard to follow each and every one of these cases. Um, so going back to the parental rights thing where I started, why are the groups doing this? Why are they banning the books? Well, they feel like these books are promoting values or ideas they think are harmful to their children. So it kind of ties in with Rick DeSantis's don't say gay law in Florida. DeSantis is the governor of Florida where, you know, they don't want any discussion of sexual orientation um, uh, what before third grade, something like that. And so, you know, hand in hand with that are book bans of anything that might be construed by these groups as discussing that or promoting education around homosexuality or transgender, you know, all of these issues that really upset the right. Um, and so this is this is kind of because book bans are kind of like this outgrowth of the culture wars between the left and the right. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much for uh, that great, great explanation. Um, this is a, it is a difficult thing to talk about um, uh, for all sorts of reasons, um, particularly because, um, you know, the, the when you think about children, you think about, you know, vulnerable people mm -hmm. um, and and sort of and particularly ones I don't have children, but one's own children, I imagine, you know, it's cranked up to 11. We know when you when you think about potential harm and things like that. Um, uh, and so, you know, when you think about why would these crazy Americans be banning books and it's like, well, because it's incredibly personal and when, and you know, when you, when you put your kids on the bus and they go to this place, the incredible, you need to sort of take it for granted. Right. But like the incredible amount of trust that you're placing in the whole process, um, is, you know, is, is dramatic. Um, and, and it is something that one can get very, uh, sensitive about, um, my particular yeah. Uh, I was just going to add for people who are outside the U.S. and mystified by this, I think it it might be helpful to understand that the education system is largely seen as run by the left. Um, I, I can't say whether that's true or not, but that's kind of like that's why the right kind of feels aggrieved. They feel like they're all these very liberal teachers pushing this um, crit you know, critical race theory. I've, I didn't mention that, but that's part of it, too, or, or you know, promoting this very progressive agenda that they feel is wrong yeah uh yeah and i think i just had with you know, my 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 personal view of this is like why is it why in particular is it kind of like you know right wing leaning states where this is happening and it, part of the answer there is actually that a feature of the right one one way into it at least for me this is you know all these are all by by the way i am imo kind of like kind of things but like one question question to ask to sort of get to the heart of this culture war conflict is why can't certain parents just say to their kids, you shouldn't believe everything you hear in school and be done with it. And there's a serious answer to that, which is that a lot of people believe that these places of are these are places not where you go to learn, but places of authority, mm -hmm. uh, places where people who are superior to you in a power hierarchy are going to tell you things and they want to live in a society where all those things that are told you can relate to them as true without having to think about them without having to criticize them without having to be suspicious of them but what you don't want is this idea that the authority is wrong about anything mm -hmm. you want to live that way and and so you know that's that's one of the reasons like one of the sort of key key kind of complaints that you'll hear on the right is why do you have to make everything so political and I'm, by the way, I'm not saying this in a disparaging way. I'm trying to say this in a sympathetic way. If you really yeah. believe that a human being is or ought to be the sum of the forces that have, like the passive result of the sum of the forces that have been brought to bear upon them, then things like having books you don't agree with in your kid's school is just like a, a, a total problem right because you really believe that if your kid comes in contact with this it's going to have a causal effect on them and you don't it's not just that there's no defense you don't want to have to build defenses right in your kid you don't want to live in a world where you got to be thinking about that all the time 
Um, and I think that 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 kind of gets to the heart of why, because people read like it's important to internalize for those of us who might not be of that persuasion to think that people, they really do believe that it's just this cause effect thing. It's yeah. that straightforward. Um, and if you want to know why people get really panicky and angry and why in particular they, they react often the way they do to the kind of what they take to be the kind of blase attitude of progressives, you know, like what, what, you know, cause you know, just go like, what's the, what's the big deal. And they're like, everything, yeah. uh, everything's at stake in this. Um, and, and so that's, you know, that's that to me anyway, is one of the, one of the reasons that like, it's really important to get into other people's mindsets when you think about this, um, which again, that's not to be sympathetic either <laughs> in, in a certain sense, but it's important to understand if the stakes are really high for people, there might there might be a reason that you can at least not you don't have to agree with it but that you can divine yeah i think there was also a lot of anger continuing anger at what happened with schools in the united states during the pandemic with um you know in the blue states they were more likely to be closed for longer periods in the red states not so much and so you still have like parents just angry at some of the decisions that were made i don't know how much that feeds into it but it certainly feels like it's all bubbled up and at the same time and of course there are there's you know all kinds of you know um disagreements with the way american culture is heading towards more diversity and things like that that you know i, I don't want to have this conversation without mentioning that a lot of this is a resistance to that yes. um uh and particularly with with race and sexuality and things like that there's a this is this is in part a manifestation of of, of resistance to those changes um and you know that that's an important element to 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 you know face with open eyes as well um i guess probably uh the second last thing i'd like to ask you about um is what do you see happening in the book publishing industry in in 2023 what are some of the, the sort of trends that we should uh, keep an eye out for we talked a little bit about one of them, the audiobook situation. Um, if AI audiobooks are going to start populating all of the major retail outlets like Audible. So I'm keeping a pretty close eye on that. Um, very curious to see how sales play out in 2023 and if we see them basically sink <laughs> to 2019 levels. Right now, that's seeming more and more likely. Um, I'm curious to see what happens with TikTok because it has been such a dramatic mover of adult fiction sales. TikTok is starting to implement more, let's say like uh, monetization, more avid marketing and promotion, things that will make them money. And assuming that, you know, TikTok doesn't get banned in the United States. I don't think it will, but there's going to be some, it'll be interesting to see if TikTok remains such a strong player for book sales. Once TikTok starts, whatever monetization, you know, uh, objectives that they have. So you can already see a little bit of discontent among book talk community people that, that the space is starting starting to become commercialized. There are more marketing partnerships with publishers and booksellers. There's more pressure to sell. There's uh, been intimations that TikTok might prioritize content that sells better. And so if, if, if what we fear comes to pass, which it always seems to with social media, um, will TikTok kind of lose its... I don't know the the halo effect that it's cur currently having on book sales. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, and the last thing I guess I wanted to ask you about was um, what will you be up to in 2023? Uh, well, my first responsibility of the year is to go to Digital Book World. I'll be speaking there um, as well as a number of conferences throughout the year. And But other than that, I don't know that I have anything big on the horizon. I am going to be moving my newsletter, the hot sheet, um, to a new subscription platform, which will make the, the big reason for that is it will make the full historical archives available for search to subscribers. So that is a project that's been two years in the making. So every, every single word published since 2015, um, I'm very, very proud to have accomplished this. So that that's coming in the first month of the year. 
and uh, just in the interest of pointing people to some of the some of the work that you do, you also uh, do these these courses. Um, oh, and, yes. And, yeah, and I was wondering if you could just like tell people a little bit about that that part of what you do. Sure. So if my paid newsletter is one half of the business, the other half is the online classes. These are one-off webinars. They're typically one to two hours long. Uh, I teach a handful, but most of them are by guest instructors, people I've known for many years in the writing and publishing space, uh, going all the way back to my time at Writer's Digest magazine. So my, my mission here is to provide affordable instruction. So most of the classes are 25 bucks. Um, and it's, it's something that I just take a lot of joy and satisfaction from because people who might not have access to quality writing instruction, like at college or at a university, they can't, you know, they can't invest in an MFA. They can't invest in some of the more expensive classes. They can still get a quality one to two hours of instruction, um, live or recorded. And uh, yeah, the website is janefriedman.com for anyone listening who might be interested. Um, and uh, also, I would uh, highly recommend Jane's um, uh, YouTube channel. Um, you do these, you know, Sunday business sermons and things like yes. that. You're very generous with your time um, and you have guests on and things like that for your for your videos where you talk about sort of the challenges writers face and give them some guidance and all, all, all the way from, you know, uh, you know, how to get a how to get a book published to like details of websites and things like that, mm -hmm. uh, and so I highly recommend that. Uh, and for anyone watching or listening, wherever you found it, it's true that if you like and subscribe, it sort of helps our audience grow. Uh, so please, please do that if you're up for it. And thank you very much, Jane, for being on our first uh, third time interviewee on the podcast. Thank you, Len.